All right, so this chapter, um, we're going to discuss different health problems um, that are seen in the school age child as well as um, adolescents, which is chapter 16. Um, so there's two types of disorders of continence that occur in this age group. Um, the first one is enuresis, which is incontinence of the bladder. And the second one that we're going to discuss is encopresis, which is incontinence of the bowel. Um, so with enuresis, again, this is bladder incontinence, and this is going to occur in children who are five years and older. Um, so they've already established bladder control. Um, and then they start having incontinence episodes. Um, to be diagnosed, they, these have to happen at least twice a week for greater than three months. And this can occur at night um, or during the day. Um, they do seem to, this does seem to be more common in boys over um, females. Um, the most important thing to rule out um, in these kids is making sure that there's no um, comorbidity, like they don't have diabetes, they don't have a urinary tract infection, because um, one of the most indicative signs of a UTI in children is um, incontinence and urinary incontinence in a child who's already established um, control of their bladder. Um, there is a primary enuresis, which is defined as bedwetting in children who have never been dry for an extended period of time. So this is children who um, have not established um, continence. They have not been potty trained for whatever reason. Um, and then secondary incontinence, which is usually the one that we would see in the doctor's office with a complaint, is secondary, which means that the onset has happened after they've had a period of established urinary continence. Um, these could also be, um, if it's not an infection or diabetes, it could be related to um, some sort of structural um, problem. Um, there's this thing called kidney reflux, which we see in kids, which could be related to that. Um, it could be related to some neurological deficit. Um, they, so there could be a lot of reasons. Um, there could also just be, it could be an emotional response. Um, if a child um, has some kind of anxiety, there's changing schools, um, parents got divorced, a death of a parent or someone very close to them, um, another sibling being born, all of these could also trigger this um, from developing. So when discussing this concern with the parents, it's really important to get, um, you know, baseline information, especially about their toilet training um, prior to this occurring, and then making sure we rule out any of those um, infectious reasons for why they might have um, incontinence. So um, what are we going to do with these kids that present with um, anuresis? So after, you know, careful evaluation, you know, ruling out any kind of structural problem, infection, disease process, um, we're going to start with just kind of more like behavioral modifications. So that would involve like putting them on like a really scheduled routine of going to the bathroom. And making sure we're avoiding liquids, you know, late in the evening, like nothing after six o'clock. Um, those will kind of be like the first line um, treatments. If that doesn't work, we might incorporate some um, bladder retention exercises. So this is like Kegel exercises um, to help strengthen all of those muscles. Um, we might also have to wake them during the evenings um, to go to the bathroom to avoid them having an accident in the middle of the night. Um, and then there are also these little devices. Um, if any of the previous things don't work, then we would move on to some sort of a device that kind of like alarms them that they're urinating. So it kind of like triggers their body to remember, okay, I need to wake up, I need to go to the bathroom. Um, our last um, option would be a medication. 
Um, we definitely don't want to jump to this first because, um, of course, there are side effects to all medications, and especially in children. Um, first line, we're going to offer desmopressin, um, which is an antidiuretic, so it's going to reduce the amount of output. Um, we're going to um, the next one would be a tricyclic antidepressant, which would just inhibit the, the um, sense to urinate. And then oxybutin, which is an anticholinergic drug, which reduces the bladder contraction. Um, encopresis, again, is the incontinence of bowel. Um, this is also more common in males. Um, there is a primary and secondary. Primary meaning over the age of four, and they have not established bowel continence for any length of time, whereas secondary is when they develop incontinence after um, they've established it prior. Um, this also, just like um, enuresis, can be um, triggered by some kind of psychological stress or in a, you know certain type like of neglect and things like that. Um, but also one of the big culprits with encopresis is um, constipation or impaction um, because it can cause um, them to kind of lose the sensation that they have stool in there and then loose stool will kind of come out around it um, and then they're just kind of unaware of what's going on, um, which then they have accidents. Um, so the most important thing um, is just making sure that we keep them on a regular schedule. Um, so again, constipation can be a major factor in this, um, just because having um, the constipation can impair the normal movement and contraction of the colon, um, so it can affect their ability um, to evacuate the colon completely. Um, there's a lot of like bullying that can be involved with children that um, leak stool or have stool accidents. Um, so we have to make sure that we, number one, determine the cause um, of this condition um, and then make sure we get them on a regular routine. Um, so like, you know, having them sit every day at a certain time, you know, have like some kind of a chart or reward system. Um, and then, you know, dietary, we want to eliminate dairy, increase their fiber, increase their water intake, um, and make sure these kids are moving around. Um, typically, this is going to be something that's going to take a while to um, resolve. Um, so you have to make sure that the parents um, understand their part in the treatment. And then if it is related to some kind of psychological um, crisis or trigger, then we want, would want to get that treated as well. Um, attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, also referred to as ADHD. Um, this is another big problem that can be seen in the school age child, um, typically because they are in school and in the school setting is when you see these, um, you know, degrees of inattention and hyperactivity um, in the classroom because they're just not capable of sitting still and, and staying focused for long periods of time. Um, the definition of ADHD is um, a developmentally inappropriate degrees of inattention, impulsiveness, and hyperactivity. Um, this typically begins before the age of seven. Um, it's more common in boys than girls. Um, what I want you to remember about ADHD is that you have to remember the definition, the term developmentally inappropriate degrees, because all kids have some level of inattention, impulsivity and hyperactivity. Um, but you have to see if it's, you know, like completely over the top compared to the rest of the classroom to compare to their brothers and sisters. And then also just, you know, developmentally, where are they at? What is expected of them at their age? 
um, you know, what is their capacity of attention. Um, in order for it to be diagnosed, these um, behaviors have to be seen in two separate settings. So typically we see this at home and we see this at a school setting. Um, it's important to get feedback from both teachers, parents, and then other family members as well, not just from a parent standpoint. And then also the behaviors have to interfere with the child's ability to actually um, function and learn and gain skills. Um, these are some additional signs of or symptoms of ADHD in children. Um, distractibility is um, a major manifestation of this condition. Um, and this can be due to external stimuli as well as internal stimuli. Um, you know, if, if a child's doing an activity that's not um, enjoyable or what they would prefer to do, it's harder for them to keep um, on track over, you know, preferred activities. Um, but they might, may also have, you know, some risky behavior. They might excessively talk. Um, you know, unable to sit still, very unorganized. Um, all of these can kind of uh, be classified into ADHD symptoms. And it is important to note that you can have attention deficit disorder um, without the hyperactivity component, and you can also have the hyperactivity component without the attention deficit um, component. Um, so they can be two separate diagnoses. Um, it's really important um, when trying to get a diagnosis of ADHD um, to stress the need um, for a complete evaluation of the child. So this is going to involve um, the pediatrician, you know, the family, including other family members outside of the immediate family, um, the teachers from school, um, a psychologist, um, as well as ruling out um, anxiety, depression, opposite, oppositional defiant disorder, um, language and learning disorders. Um, all of those things need to be evaluated and ruled out prior to giving a kid this um, diagnosis. Um, it's, it's fairly easy and unfortunately, um, you know, some parents just want that diagnosis be made so they can put them on medication and then the problem, so to speak, can be fixed. Um, but sometimes it's a little bit more complex. So it's really important to make sure that you get to the root cause um, before determining the diagnosis. Um, when talking about the management of ADHD, um, just the same as the diagnosis, it requires um, everyone to be involved. Um, in the treatment, um, you know, first we're going to uh, try behavioral therapy. Um, this is going to hopefully prevent undesired behavior. Um, you would do this, this by teaching the parent about, you know, setting up a reward system, um, giving them positive reinforcement, um, rewarding small increments of good progress on things like homework or reading, et cetera. Um, and then also discussing with the parent appropriate, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Appropriate punishments or um, consequences for, for bad behavior. You don't want it to be too harsh, um, but it needs to be age appropriate as well as developmentally appropriate. Um, also, in the classroom, they're going to have to have some management there. The teacher is going to have to make sure that they're in um, a setting in the classroom where it's free of distraction. They might have like a little bit more quiet in that area. They may require extra time um, to take tests or to complete assignments. Um, they may even need um, a pair pro or a, a teacher's assistant to sit with them to kind of help get them through an assignment. Um, and same with the environment. The environment's at home. They need to have a designated area to do homework or reading. Um, that is, you know, like dim lighting, you know, not a lot of colors, um, not a lot of clutter. Same in the classroom. They need to have this um, same environment in the classroom. 
Um, we typically would try to do all of these things first before then um, offering to try medication. Um, but medica medication is definitely um, a treatment option if the behavioral and environmental stuff alone doesn't um, correct the behaviors. Again, these are just some parenting strategies. I already kind of touched on them. Um, positive attention, so we want to reward good behavior, um, giving clear, concise instructions, um, praising for little efforts, establishing reward systems, and then having consistent consequences so that the child knows what to expect. Um, so medication treatment, um, if this is what's decided is needed for kids with ADHD, um, we're going to try methylphenidate first. Um, for, this is for kids uh, five years and older. Um, it is a stimulant. It has both short-acting or long-acting options. Um, but it is important to make sure that parents are aware of the side effects. And this is one of the reasons why we try to jump to medications first, because um, it can have you know a pretty profound effect on their appetite, um, which can cause weight loss, it can cause insomnia, it can raise their blood pressure. Um, there is some concern about it may suppress uh, growth over time, um, and then also concern of codependency. Um, if a child is taking medication, we want to make sure that the parent knows to give it to them every day of the week, just to provide the consistency um, for the child. Um, some parents, you know, try to, um, you know, not give it to them on the weekends, but then it can be harder for the child to kind of like get back, you know, together when it's Monday morning and it's time to go to school. Um, because the medication does affect their appetite, uh, we usually recommend to parents to give them their first dose after they've eaten breakfast so that they get a good breakfast in. Um, and then obviously we have to monitor their weight. Um, if there's too much weight loss, then we're gonna have to um, either try different medication or um, stop having them take the medication altogether. Um, school phobia is defined as an extreme reluctance um, to attend school for um, a sustained period of time, um, usually related to anxiety um, or fear of a school-related experience. Um, your book also prefers it's a school refusal or school avoidance. Um, <clears throat> and this is when a child has, a, you know, a true fear of going to school. Um, this is not the same as you know, like just a kid not wanting to go one day or like them pretending to be sick, like that can be very normal um, with uh, kids, you know, in elementary school. Um, the difference is, um, you know, having a very extreme reaction or very extreme um, resistance to go and that that same reaction occurs for several days. Um, this might also be related to like um, church or going to like you know, like a birthday party or something like that. Um, so it's like a very big anxiety reaction to um, some kind of a social event. Um, typically, these symptoms present the same as anxiety. Um, so they might have, you know, where they're breathing really fast, um, crying, shaking. Um, they may complain of certain physical symptoms like stomach ache, headache. Um, and then these symptoms may just vanish as soon as you say that the child doesn't have to go to school. Um, so if it is found that the child does have school phobia, um, so it's important to make sure that we treat the cause of this. So is it a true anxiety um, disorder? Did something happen at school? Is the child being bullied? Um, you know, if it is, anxiety, um, we might offer like psychology um, services to them. They may require some kind of medication treatment if it's um, really severe. 
And then if it's, you know, like a social issue, like with friends or a bully, then that would need to be addressed um, with the school itself and then reassure the child that they're safe um, and that the teachers there will take care of them. Um, childhood depression um, is also a concern with this age group, especially as, as children get a little bit older and into their the adolescence age. Um, sadly, depression does um, go underdiagnosed and undertreated with this group, um, specifically because um, children and adolescents aren't usually good at expressing their feelings. Um, they typically will act out, um, you know, they'll have bad uh, performance in school, um, you know, they'll, they won't have like, you know, a friend group, they won't want to participate in any kind of activities. Um, and typically they have lower self-esteem, um, they have, you know, feelings of hopelessness, um, they're very negative when it comes to how they feel about themselves. Um, a lot of adults and caregivers think that, you know, like their behavior is just like a phase and that they'll grow out of it. Um, so it's important to, um, you know, educate families about the signs and symptoms and the risk um, of depression. You know, if depression can increase um, these people's risk for, you know, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, um, suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation. Um, it will also impair their social functioning. It will impair their academic development. So, you know, we need to make sure that we're treating and diagnosing these kids appropriately. Um, children may also um, show signs and symptoms that are more consistent with depression. Um, so feelings of helplessness, you know, lots of thoughts about death, energy loss, isolating themselves. Um, they could be very irritable or angry, abandoning hobbies, difficulty sleeping, and then changes in their eating habits, whether it's not eating enough or overeating um, at mealtimes. Acne is a, um, it's not a very, you know, life-threatening problem. Um, there aren't a lot of, you know, risk that come with acne. However, um, almost all people will be affected by acne to some extent um, throughout their adolescence. Um, you know, more than 50% are affected. Um, these are typically related to hormonal influence. Um, it is familial as well. So if your parents had really bad acne as adolescents, then the higher the chances that you will. Um, the biggest thing is the effect that acne has on adolescent self-esteem. Um, so that's why it's important as medical professionals and physicians to make sure that um, the problem is emphasized. Um, there are things that you can do um, to help decrease the risk of um, acne getting out of control. Um, you know, the first option, we're going to just make sure they have a routine um, facial washing um, system in place. So that's they're washing their face in the mornings and the evenings. Um, that has to do with the overactivity of the sebaceous glands, and then these are getting plugged. So the more that they keep their skin clean and free of the oils, the less likelihood of them getting plugged up and causing um, the acne to develop. Um, if medications are needed, we can try um, topical retinoids um, first um, because they treat active lesions, but they also work to prevent recurrence and they help with to decrease the amount of scarring. Um, the next option up would be benzoyl peroxide, which has an antibacterial agent in it, so it inhibits the formation of the acne, um, and then it is also can be available over the counter in different like creams and washes. Um, these are the benzo the the benzoyl peroxide is effective in treating both inflammatory and non 
inflammatory agent. Um, puberty um, obviously occurs during adolescence. Um, so I did want to touch on a couple of things. This does come from chapter 15, um, health promotion of the adolescence. Um, but the Tanner stages are what is used to kind of um, identify what stage of puberty, pubertal maturation the child's in. Um, so it is very sequential. Um, the, the age that it starts and how long it takes varies significantly from child to child. Um, but in girls, the initial um, indication of puberty is the appearance of breast buds. Whereas for males, the first indication of puberty um, is testicular enlargement. And you can see down here, the average age um, varies, um, you know, by ethnicity, but they're all around age 12. Um, so this is a picture from your book. Um, it shows the different stages um, of the standard stages um, for the chest and the breast. Um, so stage one is, you know, no, no puberty changes have occurred. Um, so stage two is when the breast buds um, develop. And then stage three is when um, the, um, there's further enlargement of the breast as well as the areola. Um, stage four is when the areola like start to stick out and they form a secondary bond. And then stage five is the final um, maturation of the breast. And you can see in your book, they have the different stages for um, female pubic hair as well as for um, the males with their penis and um, testicular growth as well as their pubic hair changes. Um, some health problems related to the male's reproductive system. Um, the first one that I'm going to discuss is a varicel. Um, and this is the enlargement of the testicular vein. Um, it's usually um, described as an asymptomatic mass in one scrotum, or they might have an aching sensation, but typically this does not cause pain. Um, the reason why it needs treatment, though, is because it can um, cause infertility in males. Um, so we're going to treat this by surgically um, immobilizing um, that vein. Um, epididymitis is an inflammation of the epididymis. Um, this typically is associated with STDs in people under the age of 35. And then if it's found in people over the age of 35, then it's usually um, not from an STD. It's usually from some kind of a bacterial infection, um, or it could be caused by local trauma. These people will have um, unilateral uh, pain, scrotal pain, redness, and swelling. Um, they're going to require antibiotics, um, analgesics for pain control um, and then just you know like being careful with like lifting and positions and things like that. Um, testicular torsion is either the partial or complete occlusion of the vein within the testicle. Um, this is a surgical emergency to prevent the necrosis of that vein or testicle. Um, these these typically this occurs in teenagers around the onset age is around 13 um, but they'll have a sudden onset of extreme pain on one testicle it may be um, may or may not be swollen um, but the pain is going to be quite significant some health problems um, related to the female reproductive system um, the first one is um, amenorrhea um, this is related to menarche or the menstrual cycle. Um, and so amenorrhea is the absence of menses. Um, there's primary and secondary. Primary um, is defined as 
menses that has not occurred um, by the age of 14 in the absence of secondary sexual characteristics or the absence of menses by the age of 16 in the presence of normal sexual characteristics. Um, so those sexual characteristics are, you know, the development of breast buds, pubic hair, and things like that that was discussed um, relating to the tanner stages. Um, and then secondary, the uh, child's had a menstrual cycle and then stopped having one for at least six months. Um, irregular menses can be common in adolescence um, just because of all the hormonal changes. Um, so typically, um, you know, if they do have very irregular periods, they might recommend birth control as a treatment. Um, but if they're just complete, if the menstrual periods are just completely absent, you want to make sure, um, number one, you rule out pregnancy, um, but then also look at like, you know, that their weight, their BMI, do they have um, acne, are they at risk of uh, PCOS, um, do they have short stature, all of these can be related to some kind of like endocrine problem. Um, but always, always uh, make sure that pregnancy is rolled out first for any complaint of um, lack of a menstrual cycle in a female. Um, dysmenorrhea is pain during or shortly before menstruation. Um, and this is a pretty common complaint um, that is seen um, with OBGYNs or primary care doctors. Um, Primary dysmenorrhea is defined as um, dysmenorrhea associated with the ovulation cycle. Um, this occurs because of the re release of prostaglandins with the menstrual cycle. Um, so pain usually begins um, with menstruation and then lasts for up to 48 hours afterwards. Um, secondary dysmenorrhea, though, is defined as pain painful menses associated with a pathological condition. So this would be like endometriosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, fibroids. Um, this pain is usually described as dull or aching, as well as feelings of bloating and pelvic fullness. So the difference is primary is associated with the ovulatory cycle, whereas secondary it means that there's some kind of other reason for um, the pain. Um, depending on if it's primary or secondary, we're going to treat it with NSAIDs. Um, oral contraceptives help because these um, lessen the amount of um, shedding that occurs. Um, dietary changes and then um, exercise can also decrease the pain with menstruation. <clears throat> Um, obesity, we're finding to be more and more of a problem in childhood. Um, the research has shown the long-term consequences of being obese, um, you know, the physical, being at risk of high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, heart attack, um, psychological um, anxiety or depression, and then social complications would include, you know, just, you know, like riding on a bus or flying on an airplane or just feeling uncomfortable like, you know, in a bathing suit at a pool party, um, things like that. So, you know, all of those problems for an adolescent are, you know, 10 times harder to deal with. Um, I'm, I'm sure you guys have talked about obesity before, so you kind of understand the different ways that this can develop. You know, the biggest reason is usually in an energy imbalance. So they're consuming way more food than, they're, um, than the amount of energy that they're expelling. Um, there is a genetic link um, as well to obesity, as well as just, you know, if their energy is imbalanced, as well as they're not active, their parents aren't active, everybody just sits around all day, you know, that's obviously going to set them up for an unhealthy lifestyle. Um, and therefore they would develop into an unhealthy weight. Um, there are some sociocultural factors, um, depending on like, you know, the type of food that 
the family cooks and eats. Um, and of course, you know, there's individual um, reasons for it as well. The most important thing um, with the management of obesity is to prevent obesity from occurring. Um, so this would come into place, you know, in primary care doctors, pediatrician offices when discussing eating habits, activities, you know, how much screen time, how much water are they drinking? Um, all of those things need to be educated to the parents to make sure that um, the child has a well-balanced diet as well as getting the appropriate amount of exercise. Um, if the child is already obese, um, then obviously we're going to change their diet. Um, we're going to want to make sure that they, you know, avoid sugar-sweetened beverages, um, making sure they're eating lots of fruits and vegetables, um, avoiding, um, you know, like high-fat, high-saturated fat foods. Um, but ha it is important to remember, though, because these are still children, that we want to avoid elimination diets or fad diets. So we're never going to recommend um, to a parent to eliminate all carbs from a child's diet um, because or all sugar, because that's number one. It's practically impossible. Um, and they still do need carbohydrates um, for their development. Um, behavior modification um, and exercise. So again, we're going to make sure we're getting these kids moving at least at least an hour a day, um, encouraging that through positive reinforcement, getting the family involved in the exercise, finding some kind of a, a you know a peer activity or a peer sport that they can play with, play with other kids their age, just to kind of make the exercise a little bit more fun. Um, and then, you know, as nurses, our role is to help with adherence to the plan, educating the parents, um, and then offering any um, resources that are needed. You know, do they need nutritional counseling? Um, do they need to see a behavioral therapist? Um, do they need assistance with, you know, being able to afford healthier food options? Um, things like that to make sure that the you know, they're set up for success with managing their child's condition. Um, anorexia is <clears throat> an eating disorder characterized um, by distorted body image and then refusal to maintain a minimally normal body weight and then um, extreme weight loss. So um, someone with anorexia is going to um, you know, limit um, how, what they're actually taking in and eating um, to the very extreme. Um, whereas a bulim bulimia is characterized by repeated episodes of binge eating, followed by inappropriate compensatory behavior. So this would be like self-induced vomiting, using laxatives, um, or very extreme exercise to try to get rid of all the calories that they just ate. Um, so some clinical manifestations of anorexia, um, obviously they're going to have profound weight loss. Um, typically these kids are going to be, um, they're going to have body weight is going to be less than 85% of the expected norm. Um, they'll typically have lower heart rates, lower blood pressures, they'll be cold intolerant, they'll have dry, very dry skin and brittle nails, um, as well as very like thin dry hair, um, whereas a bulimia, a bulimia nervosa patient will um, appear relatively normal and even have a normal weight, may, may be a little bit overweight, um, but otherwise will look pretty normal. Um, you know, if, when diagnosing this, it'll be based off their symptoms as well as different like screening tools. Um, asking them questions, doing some lab work, and things like that. Um, the way that we're going to manage this is just reinforcing of a normal nutrition um, and then reversing um, any severe malnutrition. And then also for the anorexic, we're going to make sure that we're um, treating the disturbed pattern of um, impaired body image.
So this both um, types of patients would require some form of psychotherapy, as well as making sure that the um, parents are aware of the extent of the conditions. Um, sometimes um, teens who are struggling with anorexia or bulimia will require to be hospitalized. Um, so when taking care of these um, patients, it's important to make sure that you're doing frequent assessments, um, you know, vital signs as well as their electrolyte and fluid um, balance. Um, cardiac assessment is super important. Um, they can develop um, arrhythmias or have such a low heart rate that it could be symptomatic. Um, when breaking up different foods and coming up with like meal plans, try to get the patient involved. Avoid triggering foods that would make them want to revert back to their behavior or foods that they just really don't want to eat. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you offer them something that is kind of in the middle. And then just, you know, maintain um, good rapport with the patient, establish trust um, and things like that to kind of help them feel comfortable in this situation. And then again, they'll, you know, will be in control of their food, but just making sure that they're actually eating. And then um, they'll also be involved in behavioral therapy. Um, suicide is another big concern, especially with adolescents. Um, this is just simply due to the fact that their brains are still developing. Um, so they still can be very impulsive um, with their decisions and be a little reckless. Um, the methods that are primarily used um, are firearms, hanging, and then overdosing. It's important to understand the difference in the terms. The suicidal ideation is just the thought about committing suicide, um, where the suicide attempt is the actual um, action was carried out. Um, all teenagers or adolescents should be um, assessed on their suicide risk. They should be asked if they've ever had suicidal ideation. And if they have, then it needs to be um, you know, investigated further. Um, if an adolescent does express that they are suicidal, then they would need to be um, hospitalized um, just for their own safety. Um, management, we would um, hospitalize them and then we would address, you know, like what's the reason for their suicidal um, thoughts? You know, are they having depression? Are they um, do they have severe anxiety? Um, is there something going on at home? Um, those are things that need to be kind of evaluated. Um, as nurses, the biggest thing with the suicidal patients is just safety, um, making sure that there aren't things in the room that they could hurt themselves with, um, people aren't bringing them things that they could hurt themselves with, um, and just keeping uh, the patients safe. 